the concession. Um, in a minute, we're going to have James Slowell presenting to us on the keys of success in academia, business, and life, as you can see. Um, I do put a bit of an explicit content warning on this because he will say, <laughs> he is going to say non PC words. We apologize for that. And if it offends you, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> very sorry in advance. Um, James has presented at several different uh, YDS iterations, I think all the way from 2012 to 14 at each one. Like that. So yes, James is probably the most experienced YDS star out of a lot of us. So um, I'm really looking forward to the presentation, and I hope you enjoy it. James Stowold. Hello. <laughs> so thanks for the introduction, and thanks for the, the, the invite down here today. Um, I've been to a bunch of YDSs, as you know, and I've been to a bunch of other conferences, and I always enjoy YDS just because it's so different from every other conference, and it's kind of different every year as well. But one of the things that's just kind of constant throughout every conference I've been to is you get to about, yeah, about 11 o'clock. You've had a few talks. You've had maybe chatted for a while. You're kind of settled into your seat a little bit, and it's a bit kind of, oh, I can just have a little nap. So what I'm going to do is avoid that in this one. So we're going to start with a bit of a warm-up. If my thing was on, that would have gone to warm-up. There we go. That was slick. I'm good. So to start with, I want everyone just to sit up straight. There we go. It's good for your posture. It's good for your posture. It's good. And then put your arms in the air. Cool. And then make a load of noise. <laughs> Thank you. And then up, keep your hands up. And on three, I want you to shout out your favorite programming language. One, two, three. Of course, somebody shout it. Okay, keep your hands in the air. Okay, right, right. Now, if you have been to YDS before, put your hands down. Okay, with the check shirt. Why, why did you decide to come this year? You could have come before, you could have attended. <laughs> Is this your first year as well? Exactly the same. So why did you decide to come to the conference? Okay, fair enough, so knowledge exchange, it's always good. And you've got me. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, cheers, guys. Um, so YDS has been kind of a constant throughout my university career. So I started university in 2007 as a lowly fresher with a slightly strange sense of style um, <laughs> at the same year that YDS started. And then this year I graduated from York with my PhD with a similar strange sense of style, except it was imposed on me this time. And throughout that time, there's always been around. And I always just assumed that it was something the older kids did. You know, it's fine. It was just something which happened in the pod or happened in one of the common rooms. And it wasn't until I started to get towards the end of my undergrad and I started to do my master's that I realized it was something I could take part in, I could actually get involved in. And it's kind of good that I did. Because when I look at my CV now, it would be a bit bare if it didn't have YDS on it. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> so I started back in 2012, and this was uh, when we were still upstairs here. We were in the lake house. And I immediately was like, well, I'll get involved. I'll be a PC member. Why not? Um, and I did a presentation. This one was on my master's. My master's was something ridiculous, like um, using chemical reactions to model neural networks. So it was about as ridiculous as I could get because I like doing ridiculous things. That's why I'm in academia. And somehow I ended up with the best presentation award. I'm not entirely sure how. I think it's more timing during the day than anything else. Everyone was awake and there were more people in the room, so it was a biased sample. But it was great, and I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And it was the first time I'd really presented on my research to my peers. Before, I'd done presentations and done talks, but they weren't on my ideas. And there's something so fundamental about presenting an idea which is so personal to you because you came up with it and putting it out into the world to be critiqued. And one thing I love about YDS is it provides that safe environment where you can do that. Where, you know, somebody isn't, there isn't going to be a professor at the back who's going to slate you because you don't, they don't like your, your idea and they're going to lay into you for ages. No, because it's a nice, friendly environment. So then I came back the next year. I was like, okay, great. I started my PhD. And I went and I came back in 2013. Um, being the cocky bastard I am, I was like, okay, well, I won best presentation last year. <laughs> How difficult would it be to win it again? <laughs> Pretty difficult. So it turned up in that time, I started talking, did a talk about, uh, what was it? 
it was, it was cognitive robotics and life in society or something like that, social acceptance of robotics. And to be honest, I mainly just wanted to do a load of slides with Mean Girls references in them, <laughs> <laughs> which worked quite well. Um, and only one or two people picked up on them, which is always good. And again, PC member. And by this point, I quite enjoyed the idea. I quite enjoyed the format. I quite enjoyed being able to do talks which I otherwise wouldn't be able to do for a long time. And then, so when 2014 came around, I was like, okay, well, I want to get involved properly this time. I don't just want to sit on the PC. I don't just want to do a talk on my research. And so I decided to be a PC member, obviously, but also chair the organizing committee. I was going to be general chair. Um, this was great. It had its ups and downs, as I'm sure everyone who's run one will attest to. Um, and one of the things, when I was asked to do this, I was asked to sort of go back through what I did at YDS, and I started really thinking on it. And we had, so Matt, who sat down the front here, was the PC chair for the same year. And one of the things I realized was that without Matt, this conference wouldn't have happened at all. Because I fucked off to Switzerland for two months. <laughs> <laughs> so it genuinely wouldn't have happened. Me trying to run conferences, run uh, meetings via Facebook Messenger just doesn't work. Um, and what we realized was that at the start, YDS was great. Everyone wanted to be involved. We had loads of people sign up for it. We had loads of people who were really excited about organizing it. They were really motivated. They responded to emails really quickly. But after maybe a month or two, this started to tail off. People got a bit tired. They were like, oh, it's another email from James. And we started to realize that there was just a core three or four people who were really devoted to it. And they were pushing through. Only some other people on the periphery who did some work for us, and it was great, and it was really helpful. But they were just very slow at responding to things. And the more I thought about this, the more I realized that it, it kind of mirrors what you do in a PhD. In a PhD, you start off in first year. You start off and you're really excited about your topic. You're really excited about reading about it. You're really excited about everything. You want to tell everyone about it. You want to talk about it all day long. And everyone wants to hear about it because it's interesting and you're doing interesting work. But after the first year or so, you, people tend to get a bit bored of it. People tend to, you know, oh, he's still talking about bloody robotics. Shut up already. I just want a pint. Like, or just like, haven't you finished school yet? Like, why are you still there? You've been at school for 27 years, for Christ's sake. And by that point, Christmas becomes a bit of a chore. And you, you start to lose motivation. And what you get is this valley. <laughs> the valley of shit. And this typically will kick in towards the end of second year. And if you haven't got to this point in your PhD, I guarantee you this will happen. This is a well-documented phenomenon. Everyone who's completed a PhD will have that valley somewhere in there. And there's a lot of smiling, nodding faces at the back, people who have completed their PhD. Going, yeah, I remember that well. Now, for me, that valley of shit was a three-month period where I was trying to find one bug in my code. Bear in mind that my code wasn't complicated. It was complex. It wasn't complicated. It was, whoops, about 150 lines of code. And it took me three months to find a bug in it. To give you a bit of context, what I was doing was I was doing robotics and swarms and stuff like that. And I wrote a piece of, I wrote a simulation in one language. Because it was easy to write in that language and really quick to develop. But then I wanted to put it on a robot. So I had to rewrite it in C. Easy peasy, a couple hundred lines of code. Nice and simple. I did it, and they looked about the same. So I was like, no, I, I'm an academic. I must check that it is the same. Because, you know, five. And so I ran some tests. And annoyingly, they were slightly different. But different enough that they were statistically non-similar. So three months later, I'm literally head-busting my desk every day trying to work out how there, there must be other lines of code which is, other than this, which is screwing this up. There was a bug in the language. Not in C, for the record. Um, I'd say a bug. It was a, a difference in implementation style. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but I found it. I won't repeat what I said when I found it. But fortunately, it was an open source language, so I could get the code. Otherwise, I'd still be at it. But this value of shit is something which happens everywhere. It's not just PhDs. It's not just YDS. 
It's every time you try and introduce a new idea or a new concept or change people's cultural ways of doing things. So in a company, for example, if you want to shift culture towards using data rather than making stuff up, you'll encounter a value shift. And why am I telling you this? Now, I'm telling you this because the first years in the audience are going to encounter this. And I want you to get through it. I don't want you to crash and burn. Because as much as some people might think I'm a grumpy bastard, I do actually think that people should get PhDs, <laughs> if they deserve them. Um, and I want you to get through it. I want you to march through it. I don't want you to be struggling through it the same way I did. I want you to go through it to such an extent that it's a mere blip on your radar, which you can just blast straight through. And then you go out into the world. And in the world, these are everywhere. Startups. They call it a valley of death because business. They don't like saying shit a lot. I'm an academic. It's great. I say what I like. They do some research. They do some development. Look at this money. It's just tipping down here. Now, what isn't on here is the fact that motivation does this kind of the same thing we saw in a PhD. It kind of does that. And it drops at the same time that you're getting to the bottom of that valley of death of money. Same thing here. Profit and loss. Again, death valley, business, boring. But what's key here is that, OK, motivation's high. Yeah, OK, we've got an idea. Let's get on board with it. Let's do it. Yeah, it's great. After a while, oh, well, you haven't actually shown that it works. You show that it works in this one small case, but we now want to implement it. People get bored. They get fed up. They want results now. You lose motivation. You lose investment. And eventually, if you make it out, you end up actually implementing stuff. Now, there's a great quote, and I don't know who said it, which annoys me. I tried to find it, cite sources. And so the source which I got this quote from was Kevin MacLeod on Grand Designs, because I'm really cool like that. <laughs> and it's, revolution is exhausting. And if we think of bringing a new idea into the world, as being a revolution of sorts, it makes sense that it's exhausting. A PhD is exhausting. So how do we get through it? I will tell you. I'm just going to leave it to the end. First of all, I'm going to tell you a story. If we rewind 18 months, I was at the tail end of my PhD. I think I was writing up my uh, lit review at the time. Rewriting my lit review, that is. Um, and. Uh, Basically, I was applying for postdoc jobs. I was applying for any job. At this point, I was like, I should go work in a bar. They've got money. They'll give me alcohol as well. It'd be great. <laughs> Q, you know, standard existential crisis. Is this really what I wanted to do in my life? Am I doing the right thing? Is this even worth my time? What am I doing? Ugh, usual stuff. And at this point, I was approached by a company, a company called Hiscox. They are a specialist insurance company. They do cool things, as well, as cool as insurance gets. They ensure things like spaceships. Relatively cool. Um, and the, what they wanted me to do was to come in and be their kind of lead data scientist. They wanted to use data science more often. They wanted to use it throughout their business. They wanted me to lead the charge. Great. Really good idea. Really good opportunity. The exposure to the CEO, the CEO, the CFO was huge. It was a really great opportunity to forge my way through the corporate world. And I got to do cool tech. So I got to work with a company called Digital Fine Print. They're a startup. They started about a year ago using social media analytics within insurance. And I got to be that subject matter expert. Plus, I got to go to work dressed like this, <laughs> um, which I despise, by the way. There's a reason I'm not wearing a suit today. It's I've worn enough suits in my life now. Um, but what I found, that even though this was an incredible opportunity, my motivation did that. OK? Over the next, oh, apparently I've got an update, um, the next sort of 12 months, it went down. Now, you can tell I've been in the corporate world for a little bit of time because there are no labels on this access. <laughs> but that's time. That's either motivation or energy, depending on how you look at it. Now, me being the rational, intelligent, highly educated, good-looking, humorous, <laughs> modest person that I am, um, I started to rationalize in much the way that most of you would do as well. You're intelligent. You can work things out. It's fine. So I rationalized. It's fine. It's merely a, a dip on my otherwise meteoric rise to stardom. Oh, it's just, it's just a valley of shit. I've done this before. It's fine. I can push through. 
And it's just the natural ebb and flow of life. This is just a down, there'll be an up shortly afterwards. And my personal favorite, the grass is greener excuse. It's just the wrong company for me. If I join a startup, it'll be great. If I get that job at Google, it'll be great. If I go back to academia, it'll be great. It's just this one thing. And then something happened. I had the single worst month of my life. Worse than the value of shit. I won't go into the details of it, but essentially, that's pretty close to what happened. I almost hit the bottom. I was struggling to get out of bed. It'd take me an hour and a half to get the first foot on the floor. I'd run out of energy by 10 a.m. because the amount of energy required to get out of bed and get to work and then just say hello to my boss in the morning was enough. I was done at that point. Then I had to do a full day of work. I couldn't come up with ideas. I couldn't see my way through problems. It was like there was a cloud. Now, in your PhD, you have a supervisor. Some of you have multiple supervisors. That might be good, that might be bad, depends on who they are. But what are they there for? For me, they called me on my bullshit. And I had a lot of it. But for the most part, what they're there for is to sense check you. They are there because you are so close to the problem, you can't see the obvious answer at the top. To bastardize an old idiom, they show you the forest when all you can see is the trees. That's their main job, to guide you through that. But in life, we don't get that. So I was there rationalizing what was going on because I was close to the trees. I couldn't see the forest. And it wasn't until a good friend of mine turned around and asked me a question that I realized that this, there was something wrong. She was basically acting as my supervisor at that moment. And she asked me when the last time I had a full meal was. And it was quite a while. And at that point, I had the most difficult thing I've ever had to do. Fortunately, I did it. I admitted to myself that something was wrong, that I wasn't well. So, how did we get to this point? We were here. How come this little dip at the bottom here caused so much trouble? Sure, I had a bad month, fine. Was it that bad, or should I have been able to deal with it? I argue that that's more of a normal trajectory for people's energy and motivation over life. And then when the bad month happens, okay, well, you've still got all of this in reserve. But that wasn't the case for me. For me, every time I had a trough, the peak that followed it was tiny. I wasn't recovering from those troughs. The key difference between these two lines is that I have depression. And academia is kind of ripe with mental health issues. The reason for that is that we are very good at rationalizing because we're all very intelligent people. That's why we're here. But it's also the culture. Who's seen that before? A few nods. See, we kind of giggle at it, we kind of laugh at it because some people might be writing up and thinking, I could be writing right now. But in academia, this is basically a mantra. This is something we almost chant as PhD students. I argue that this is not just a mantra, it's a bit of a death sentence. If you are constantly thinking, I should be working, I should be writing, I should be doing something on my PhD all the time, you don't take any time for you. Take a day. Take a week. Fuck it, take a month, go on holiday, live the dream. You're a PhD student, you don't have to go to work every day. Which brings me to my final point. The key, my key to success in academia, business, and life 
Got the title in there. It's great. My one key is the talk. Find a supervisor. Talk to them. Don't just talk to yourself. You are too close to the problem. If you don't approach it in the right way, you'll end up crashing and burning. And crashing and burning in that sense is very different to crashing and burning in a PhD sense. If you haven't got somebody, there are always options. Thank you.